Chapter 17. Cecilia. Hola, abuelita. I didn't want to come in the first place. That's why I suggested the vote. Why didn't my feet listen to my brain? And I'm so cold. My toes and fingertips are the worst. Now I think everyone else is realizing the same thing. I can tell by the way Emily's biting her nails, Sharon's eyes are wide, and Kai's edging closer and closer to us. There's a man who keeps looking at us. He's got long stringy hair and tattoos everywhere. Now he's talking to some other grungy men. He's pointing at us and shaking his head. Why is he watching us? What is he saying about us? I've got that want to cry feeling where my throat is tight and my nose aches. I'm not sure I can hold it back. I reach for Emily's hand and try to remind myself that I'm not alone. Words to practice. No words today, you'll never see this letter. Beso si abrazo, Cecilia. Kai. Hey frog, it's so cold my bones hurt and the tip of my nose feels like it might chip off like a piece of ice. The girls are scared, I can tell. Even Sharon, and I've never seen her scared before. I just wish that man would stop looking at us. I've got to do something. We've got to go. Now. Aviva. Date December 9th. Dear G-O-D. If Emily's okay, I promise never to complain about chores. If she's okay, I'll confess to her the truth about the cheese pizza. If she's okay, I'll be a better friend. I promise. Please. Kaylee. Dear Ms. Graham. Things are pretty bad. No one knows where Emily is. My mother came to pick me up and Blake and Henry too. Now we're all sitting in Aviva's living room trying to eat Greek pizza. The feta and spinach are making me want to hurl because I can't stop thinking about how I told Emily there was meat in the school pizza sauce. And now she might be kidnapped for real. The cops are trying to track down Emily, Kai, Sharon, and Cecilia. They think maybe they're all together, especially since it looks like Emily lied to her mom in the first place tonight. I know I haven't spent much time with Emily this school year, but I have known her since kindergarten. She's never been a liar before. Aviva. Date, December 9th. This is all my fault. I should have told about Tattoo Man right away. Ima gave me a big old lecture and started crying because I'd been asking her to drive me to school and she'd been saying no. But of course, if she'd known, she'd have dropped everything to take me. And don't I know how important safety is? And haven't I been listening to them? And all that fuss about private school when this is exactly why I need one, because I'm clearly incapable of making safe decisions. She got really mad then and shook her finger in my face and yelled at me about not speaking up. I think I shrank to nothingness right there on the spot. And then I cried so hard, my brain felt like it might explode. Kaylee put her arm around me all protective and she smelled like bubble gum and asked me to come with her to drop Blake and Henry at home. I said yes, because I didn't want Ema to keep yelling at me. At first, Ema said I was grounded and couldn't go with Kaylee, but then she changed her mind, saying she should keep Emily's mom company until there was some news. Kaylee's mother promised she'd watch us like hawks. Kaylee called shotgun, so I sat squished in the back seat between the two boys until we dropped Blake off. I had that hiccupy crying that doesn't stop, and I felt awful. Henry. Today felt like a movie. I couldn't get any of this down until I got home tonight. My brain is still hula hooping around inside my skull. It was that kind of day. Scene, squashed in the back of a red Corvette, written by the up and coming director, Henry, who will someday make millions so that he can buy 10 Corvettes. Kaylee, Aviva, stop crying. It's going to be okay. Aviva, sniffles. Kaylee, seriously, they're probably all together. They probably snuck off to a movie or something. It's the most logical explanation. Aviva, sniffles. Kaylee, stop crying. Can someone distract her or something? Henry, what good are your jokes if you can't whip them out at the right time? Henry, oh, so I was thinking this was a bad time for jokes. Kaylee, it's a horrible time for jokes, but tell one anyway. Henry, oh good, because I've been dying to say this, but I thought it would be bad timing. So Mrs. Barrett, about this car. I'm turning 16 in less than six years. By that time, this Corvette will be a shabby old thing. It'd make a great birthday present. Hint, hint. Kaylee, sarcastic. Very funny. Henry, what? You told me to. Plus, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity for me. You can't blame me for trying. Blake, uh, you can just drop me here at the park. Mrs. Barrett, Blake, there's a child missing out there. No way, I'm walking you right to your front door. 
Blake. Uh, it's the next left. Number 872. Kaylee. Maybe we can walk him up? Mrs. Barrett pulls over. If you all go together, that's fine. Henry climbs out of car. Now we can stalk you, Blake. We know where you live. Aviva trying to talk while crying. Henry, today is not a good day for that kind of joke. Henry, oops, sorry, my bad. Blake leads group around the side to garage door. Looks uncomfortable. Thanks, guys. Aviva, don't worry, they'll find her. Kaylee, we have to wait until you get in. Mother's orders. Blake unlocks door, then opens it a crack to slip in. Kaylee pushes door open, revealing that the garage had been converted into an apartment. Everyone, silent. Blake, this is just for a little while. We're getting another place soon. Kaylee, no, it's cute. You all did a great job fixing it up. It looks like a college dorm. Kitten, meow. Blake scoops up Kitten. This is my newest roommate. She keeps me company. Henry backs up. <gasps> I'm allergic to cats. That's my cue to leave. Funny coincidence. Sorry, Kaylee. Funny coincidence. I'm allergic too. Only I'm allergic to you. Henry talks to Blake while backing up out of the room. Is it just me or is she getting funnier? <gasps> Kaylee. Dear Ms. Graham, I was so curious about why Blake kept trying to get my mother to drop him off somewhere else. That's why I volunteered to walk him up. Of course, I had no idea that he lives in a garage, like the place you park extra cars. I've never heard of something like this in my whole life. Doesn't it get cold? Is it even safe? Did you know this, Ms. Graham? They have it set up pretty nice, but it's still a garage. What happens if he has to pee at night? Does he go in the regular house or in the bushes outside or walk down to the convenience store? And what about showers? I'm way too polite to ask any of those questions. I know I am gonna remember this night forever. Only I really hope I remember it because it was a great big adventure and we find Emily and she's okay. Not because of something terrible. Chapter 18, Kai. Dear Frog, we're all sitting in a square room. We are not free to leave. Yeah, I just said that. Every time I think about what mom and dad are gonna say when they get this call, I wanna disappear. I'm writing in my journal trying not to stress. Let me tell you what happened. So back at the bridge, I got the girls to agree this was a bad idea and we needed to go. We packed up real quick and started walking back to the shelter. Sharon dug in the bottom of her backpack to pull out a cell phone. I screeched, cell phone? You had a cell phone this whole time? And she snapped, I'm not stupid enough to pull it out in front of everyone. It'd get stolen. Then she started looking for a taxi service. We had less than $10 even if we pool our money together but Sharon promised her grandma would pay for the cab if we took one to her house. Sharon said, I got us into this mess and I'll get us out. But then all of a sudden, that creepy dude with tattoos blocked our path. Where are you going? And you gotta stay here. Emily and Cecilia turned on the tears right away and Sharon stood real tall like you would if you came face to face with a bear in the woods. She told him to stay away from us in this booming loud voice. I stood tall too and stepped in front of the girls. I tried to think fast, but I felt scrambled. All the advice my parents have given me over the years playing in my head. But then Emily pulled out this knife and it was a knife, like this huge gleaming blade that looked like it could gut the guy in seconds. And that did the trick. He backed up two steps and kept saying, stay here kids, you gotta stay here. All of a sudden these bright lights blinded us and it was the cops and I thought, here we go. What are the police gonna think we're doing down here? And with Emily holding a knife. I remembered the talk my parents gave me about snap judgments. I kept totally quiet and still and made sure to keep my hands in clear sight at all times. The cops made Emily drop the knife and Cecilia was wailing like somebody died and we had to stay super still until they decided we weren't criminals and wrapped us in blankets and sat us down to talk. I guess that dude with the tattoos called the cops himself. He recognized us from our neighborhood and he was worried about us being in such a dangerous place by ourselves. He wasn't a bad guy after all, just an ex-soldier who'd been living out of his car with his dog for a while. I guess we assumed what kind of guy he is based on how he looked. I can still hardly catch my breath and my brain is spinning, trying to figure out what's next. Sharon, when the cops came, all tough and gruff, 
and looking uncomfortable in their too tight uniforms, they strapped us in the back seats of their cruisers like true criminals. Kai and Emily in one car, me and Cecilia in the other. Now we're trapped in one of those rooms with the double-sided mirrors. I wonder for a moment whether it is a crime to impersonate a homeless person. If you commit a crime but don't know you're committing it, are you still busted? Emily, status, anxious, worried. Dear Hope, the police officer said our parents are on the way, but in the meantime, they keep coming back in and trying to scare us so we'll never do something this stupid again. The first time, they showed us this website that lists how many sex offenders there are in the city. Scary. The second time, they brought in photos of all the missing and exploited kids in our state. Scary. The third time, they reminded us that some of our parents discovered we were missing five hours ago that for five hours they thought we'd been stolen or hurt and killed. I couldn't stand hearing anymore. I spoke up and told the police officer that none of us would ever do something this stupid again, that we were just trying to research what it was like to be homeless for our social issues assignment. The police officer's eyebrows sprang up. This was for an assignment? He asked all barky. What school do you all go to and who is your teacher? Oops. So, 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 so unlucky, Emily. Sharon, Cecilia has been crying for an hour, nonstop, not just a little. She's crying an ocean. Her whole face has puffed up. I pat her knee and marinate in guilt. This was my idea after all. Nothing I say or do helps. She cries and cries and cries like her life is over. Except for Cecilia's raggedy gasps and whimpers, Everyone else is silent. They all must hate me. I wish this horrible idea had never, ever entered my stupid head. Kai, dear frog, on the way home from the police station, it started to pour. The rain hit the roof of our car and it was so loud, I felt like the sky was angry with us. I can't make myself write down what my parents said on the way home. I've let them down big time. There's nothing worse than seeing disappointment on my mom's face. Chapter 19. I am home now, in the bathroom. My head aches from all the crying. Mamie didn't enter one foot into the police station. She couldn't. She wouldn't. Instead, she sent our neighbor, Senora Garcia, who's a citizen. La Migra can't take her. I'm sure the police are suspicious. They must wonder why my mother didn't pick me up. What if they report us? My family will be ripped into pieces. This is terrible. I like the United States but I won't stay here without Mami. My home is where Mami is, not the country where I was born. I appreciate all Mami's sacrifice to get me here, but no joke, I will leave this place in a second. The world is crying with me. It has not stopped raining. Words to practice. No words, I'm ripping this to shreds. Besos y abrazos, Cecilia. Emily, status, wailing. <laughs> Dear Hope, I am in trouble. Huge trouble. Mom did not speak to me the whole way home. She drove with her hands tight on the wheel, jerking it left and right to change lanes. Her knuckles turned white and her jaw was set like it was made of cement. When we got home, she slammed the car door shut, leaving me to sit in the car. Now I'm staring at the headrest of the front seat and trying to decide whether to go in. I've never seen her this mad. Love and luck I need you bad, Emily. Kai. Dear Frog, my parents are unhappy that I made such a poor decision. My brother Thomas looked at me sideways and said he thought I was smarter than that. My sister Brianna hugged me hard like she used to when we were small, and little Jayla climbed in my lap and wouldn't let go. All my tech privileges are revoked for the next month. I told them they don't need to punish me because I feel bad enough myself. Dad said nice try on that one, but I'm not lying. I couldn't feel any worse than I do now. Mostly because of Cecilia. I have never in my life seen someone fall apart like that. I'm so upset I can't even read. Cecilia. Hola, abuelita. Tonight, mami gathered my hands and hers and told me we have to move. At first, I said, but mami. Only then I stopped. I know she's right. We can't take a chance. We've moved many times before. I hate it. A new start a new school, and just when I was making friends. 
I miss Emily, Sharon, and Kai already, so much that I ache. I can't believe I did this. I brought this upon us. I have no one to blame but myself. After all Mami has done for us, I went and did something stupid that could ruin it all. What was I thinking? I'm una idiota for taking a chance. Words to practice. Destroying this letter. I hate the world. Besos y abrazos, Cecilia. Emily. Status. Downcast. Dear Hope, this morning I figured out that I'm in even bigger trouble than I thought. Dad flew in from Lebanon last night. Mom called him when she thought I'd been kidnapped and he grabbed the next plane. They found me when he was mid-flight, so he didn't even know I was okay until he landed. When we picked him up at the airport, Dad hugged me so long and hard that I could barely breathe, and the stubble on his cheeks prickled me. He didn't talk about how disappointed he was until midway through breakfast. He said he thought I knew better than to do something like this. I concentrated on stabbing tiny bites of scrambled egg with my fork. Mom said I'm the most important thing in her life and how she needed to know I'm safe. It sure doesn't feel like I'm the most important thing in her life. And then my dad was all, you're usually responsible and we trust you and you gotta tell us if you're not okay. But here's the thing, I'm not okay. All of a sudden I wished I hadn't been eating all that egg because it was about to come right back up along with every little detail about Kaylee and Aviva and private school and Ms. Graham. So I tried to explain that if I did something great to make a difference, I thought they'd been proud. And then they rushed in all knee-jerk fast to reassure me that of course they're proud. They're always proud. And something about it irritated me. So I stopped them and said what I really meant. That I thought dad would make more time for me and mom would go back to being her regular self, the way she was before they got divorced. Then they were totally quiet. My dad shook a salt snowstorm all over his food before he even realized. I think they heard me. I hope they heard me. That was the strangest lecture I've ever had. I went out to eat, somehow got both my parents at the same table for an hour without killing each other, and kind of told them off. Bizarre. Love and luck, Emily.